In September of 1977, a new novel was released by author J. Anson, entitled The Amityville Horror. Now many of us know of the countless movies and sequels to this book, and the outrageous stories associated with it, but that's all Hollywood and commercialization. I'm speaking about the time before all of that, when there simply was the novel. But before we can explore the captivation of Jay Anson's book, we have to go back to November of 1974. On the night of November 13, 1974, 23-year-old Ronald Butch DeFeo Jr. systematically murdered his entire family with a high-powered rifle. This consisted of his parents, two sisters, and two younger brothers. Around 6.30 p.m. that same day, DeFeo went to a nearby bar he frequently attended, shouting, You gotta help me, I think my mother and father are shot. Friends of DeFeo, who were at the bar, returned with him to the now-famous Amityville House at 112 Ocean Avenue. Once they discovered everyone was indeed dead, they immediately called authorities. Upon investigating, detectives discovered all victims were found murdered in their beds, mostly lying face down and shot in the back. After the initial question of why wasn't Ronald DeFeo murdered as well, as this obviously occurred during the middle of the night, the account of his whereabouts has continually changed over the years. Eventually, DeFeo was prosecuted for the murders, and the following December 4, 1975, Ronald DeFeo Jr. was sentenced to six consecutive life terms. Today, DeFeo is 67 years old and still serving out his 150-year prison sentence. With DeFeo now locked away for the rest of his life, the house on 112 Ocean Avenue sat silent and dormant. The name on the sign in the front yard of High Hopes harkened back to the simpler times of 1965 when DeFeo's parents bought the house with dreams of raising a family and enjoying the quiet, sleepy neighborhood of Amityville, Long Island. Unfortunately, all of that disappeared on the night of November 13, 1974. By late 1975, the residents of Amityville had began to put the bad memories away of what happened to the DeFeos, returning to their lives and trying to forget the past. And in December of that year, another family would come to Amityville and discover the iconic Dutch colonial house with their own hopes of raising a family and experiencing the American dream. However, 28 days after moving in, they would abandon 112 Ocean Avenue, leaving behind everything they owned. In the fall of September 1977, author J. Anson publishes his novel, The Amityville Horror, detailing the harrowing events of the Lutz family and their 28-day ordeal in what's now being referred to as the most haunted house in America. The book immediately takes the country by storm and hits the national bestsellers list in no time. Some claim the popularity of the novel is due to the shift in the public's acceptance towards the supernatural, as just four years earlier in 1973, the country was still reeling from the shock of William Friedkin's film, The Exorcist. Based on the novel written by William Peter Blatty, the story centers around a fictitious account of a 12-year-old girl possessed by a demon. Blatty based his book on an actual event in New England in 1948. Anson's novelization of the events has readers terrified far past the points of books like Era Levin's Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist. Because this time, as one critic would put it, the story is true. Like the rest of the country, I myself was drawn into the world of the Amityville Horror in the late fall of 1977. While visiting my brother, his wife, who was a voracious reader, knew that I loved any subject dealing with mysteries, ghosts, or anything spooky and scary. And as I was preparing to go home that evening, my sister-in-law promptly put the novel in my lap and said, Here, take this home and read it. You're going to love it. 
I was excited and already drawn to the book thanks to the interesting cover art. I couldn't wait to get home and start reading it, and by that evening, I was in my bed, and true to her word, I was loving the book. It caught my attention and imagination right from the start. The world that Jay Anson portrayed between those pages was just as real as the world I was living in myself at that time. I could easily imagine myself in many of those very same situations, and anyone who has ever experienced something that they couldn't explain, they too were feeling the same thing I was as they read the book. It all seems so plausible. Bear in mind, I was 14 years old at the time when I read the book, and my imagination would have been highly suggestible, especially if you want to believe in those things. Only a few instances in the book did it seem a little too far-fetched. But all of us, I believe, at one time or another, have found a door open when we were certain we had closed it earlier, or perhaps we saw a dark shadow out of the corner of our eye heard the odd or unusual noise in the middle of the night coming from a room that we knew was empty. I think myself, like so many other readers, were connecting to the book because we too shared many of the same experiences in some similar fashion or another. This leads me to the question, can a house retain what's been poured into it? Can the events taken place between those walls somehow remain embedded into the structure itself, only to manifest themselves later in a spike of paranormal activity? I can say that I have lived in a couple of houses over the years that made me feel uneasy all of the time. I do recall once when searching for a new home to buy, taking a tour of a house on the market and feeling the violence of days gone past as I walked from one room to the next. It was especially evident in the master bedroom, where there were holes punched in the bedroom door. The entire room felt like there had been a lot of violence there. That alone made the decision to pass on this property quite easy. But the big question on my mind in regards to the Amityville house is, was it really haunted? We know six people were murdered in their beds while sleeping. You'd think if anything would cause a haunting, this would have to be it. We know the son was found guilty of the crime. He did try to plea insanity, saying he heard voices. But if you're up on a murder rap, I think you'd try to say anything to get a lesser sentence. And we do need to remember that Ronald DeFeo Jr. used a lot of drugs, especially LSD. Was he high the night of the murders? Only he truly knows the actual facts and events of that night. And if the house was, as he stated, filled with some dark presence that forced him to commit murder, then why is it that every single person who has bought and lived in the house since reported zero paranormal activity? In fact, the only annoyances they've claimed is the constant parade of curious onlookers driving or walking by and taking photos of their home. The first family that took over the house actually changed the half-moon windows to square ones in a futile attempt to take away the original look, hoping future ghost hunters would think that they'd got the wrong place. However, they had to know buying such a property was going to bring unwanted attention regardless of murders or the book. We know the Lutz family fled the house 28 days later. We also know every family that purchased the property since has claimed no paranormal activity has manifest during their time there. So why would new owners voluntarily leave their dream home in less than a month of living there? Amityville in the mid-1970s was upper class and quite affluent. The idea that the neighborhood was bad can quickly be ruled out. Were the Lutzes just seriously over their heads in debt? Had they bought a place they truly couldn't afford? They hadn't even made their first mortgage payment or had enough time to receive their first electric bill, let alone the other normal monthly expenses that go into running a house. So why leave so suddenly? For anyone who's ever purchased a house knows it's virtually the biggest investment you'll ever make in your life. Walking away from it is not an easy task. It's not like you can say, I have buyer's remorse and change my mind, because you're still on the hook for the monthly payments. Why make yourself homeless and throw away everything you've invested? During our research on the subject, we learned the Lutzes had sold two homes in order to place a sizable down payment on the Ocean Avenue property. And according to one of the Lutz children, 
Money was not an issue, as it was portrayed in the book. George Lutz was saving rent money by moving the business office to the house, and because there was a boathouse on the land, he was no longer making mooring charge payments for two boats. In another documentary entitled My Amityville Horror, the real Daniel Lutz speaks about the house in complete candid detail, remarking George, his stepfather, was deeply into the occult and therefore believed the paranormal events which took place were due in large to what George opened up their family to. George himself later admits that fleeing the house didn't help. Whatever had been tormenting them at the Ocean Avenue property continued following them wherever they went. The criticism over Anson's novel came when deeper research proved that on certain events, such as cloven hooves in the snow, could not have occurred due to the fact there was no snow on the date Anson proclaimed that it took place. Also, one has to consider Anson may have embellished stealing from an old story done recently here entitled The Night the Devil Walked in Devon. Several of the actual people involved in the events have claimed that much of what Anson wrote was fabricated. George Lutz himself stated, No blood came down the walls on the night of the escape. The toilets did not ooze black sludge. And others have disputed Kathy Lutz's claim that the front door was ripped from its hinges. And there have been others that have claimed the entire story was cooked up one evening after consuming several bottles of wine. Claims that the house was built on Indian burial grounds is also false. Also claims the land was reserved for where a certain tribe of Indians abandoned their mentally ill or dying. This has also been proven to be untrue. Jody, the so-called pig in the window seen by George and by Kathy Lutz, was actually a neighbor's cat that Ronald DeFeo referred to as the pig because it was so overweight. Was it all just an elaborate get-rich-quick scheme? In the end, the only ones who walked away with piles of cash were the publishers of Anson's novel and the lawyers. Anson would pass away just three years after the release of his most famous novel. The Lutzes have never wavered from their stories up until their deaths. Kathleen Lutz died in August of 2004 and George just two years later in May of 2006. The house at 112 Ocean Avenue still stands, but with another address. However, that hasn't hindered would-be ghost hunters and curious onlookers from seeking it out. Nor has it stifled dozens of books, documentaries, and a slew of movie sequels. Regardless, we cannot deny that something forced the Lutz family to leave behind a very costly investment without taking any of their personal possessions, excluding some clothes. If demons are no longer haunting 112 Ocean Avenue, did they truly leave with the Lutz family, or are they just waiting for the Wright family to once again take possession of the house? Mm-hmm.